Blog Talk Radio. Society.com and Living Dead Magazine. What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? It is episode 81 of the Calling Hours Horror Podcast. And as you know, this month on the Calling Hours Horror Podcast, we are featuring the films that compromise, or comprise, I'm sorry, the After Dark Horror Fest, Eight Films to Die For. And on this episode, we are covering director Dagan Merrill's Murder in the Dark. On to discuss the film, we will have writer-director Dagan Merrill, also known for Beneath, Broken Hill, and the upcoming Deep Burial. Writer-producer Doc Wyatt, also known for Scarecrow, Napoleon Dynamite, and Beneath. And we will also be joined by actress Mary Kate Wiles. From Dark Woods, The Sound in the Shadow, and the upcom- upcoming Zombie 360. In our digital dismemberment reviews for the evening, we're going to be covering Scream Factory's Blu ray Collector's Edition release of Tales from the Crypt, Demon Knight, and Last Doorway Productions' release of Forgotten Tales. And just so you guys know, the review of Forgotten Tales is an online screener, so there will not be an overall disc review. I don't know at this current time if our good friend Renya Young of Lost Doorway Product, or excuse me, um, Last Doorway Productions, is going to be putting any kind of special features on that disc. But I do plan on having her on a coming up episode, so we can talk a little bit more about that project. There are a couple of uh, young ladies that I've had on the show before that are a part of that project, other than uh, Renya, of course, uh, Mo Whalen, of course, and Kelsey Zukowski. So we will be talking about that in our first digital dismemberment spotlight coming up here in a few moments. In our Metal Massacre spotlight for the evening, we're going to be featuring Metal Blade recording artist Battlecross and songs from their most recent CD, Rise to Power. Just to give you a little bit of background info on that, 
thrash has proven an unkillable genre. Resistant to trends and, fan, and fads, it has remained the preserve of true metal fans worldwide, and in the hands of Battlecross, it has been pushed to the next level. Disinterested in simply recycling the classic thrash sound, this quintet has consistently brought new fire, energy, and dynamics to their metallic assault, and with rise to power, they raise the stakes once more. Building on the blistering sounds of sophomore release War of Will, it is a darker, more aggressive, and tighter record. Catchy without pandering, packed with face-melting solos, and with every track, they push their hunger to empower the masses to the forefront. We're really proud of War of Will, and we got to play those songs all over the world, which was an amazing experience. Going into this record, we had more freedom in the sense that we were able to say, well, people like what we write, so let's just write what we like, states bassist Don Slater. We never really wanted to do the same thing twice. We wanted to play the riffs that we wanted to hear, and we just wanted to keep building on our experience and raise the bar, adds guitarist Tony Asta. No one is handing us anything. We've always been about putting the work in, and we couldn't be prouder of what we've achieved with Rise to Power. So without further ado, from Metal Blade Records, the name of the band is Battle Cross. The name of the CD is Rise to Power. The song is Blood and Lies.
and welcome back. You just heard Battle Cross from their most recent CD, Rise to Power. The name of the song was Blood and Lies. Make sure to stay tuned throughout the shows. We will be playing two more tracks from this CD. Make sure to head on over to Metal Blade Records. Find out what's going on with Battle Cross. Pick up the new CD. Find out touring information and more. Check out all the great bands available through Metal Blade Records. Coming up in about 19 minutes, we're going to go into our feature interview with Dagan Merrill, Doc Wyatt, and Mary Kay Wiles from the film Murder in the Dark that is part of the After Dark Horror Fest 8 Films to Die For. But before that, it's time for some digital dismemberment. <laughs> Digital Dismemberment. And in our first Digital Dismemberment Spotlight for the evening, we are covering Last Doorway Productions. Uh, I guess most recent film, most recent one that, that I have seen, and that is Forgotten Tales. For those of you that aren't familiar with Last Doorway Productions, they are run by the fabulous Miss Misery, Renya Young. And I've covered her work in the past, and I've always been very happy, very impressed with what I've seen from her. Uh, for those of you that may not be familiar with them, I'm going to give you a list of some of the other stuff that they've worked on. Their filmography includes Peach Strikes Again, Halloween Peach, Sinner, Confession 3, Confession, out of Print, Uninvited, Confession 2, Doll Murder Spree, Whore Fanatics Commercial. Uh, they've done the Joe Flynn Show intro and outro, uh, the Vampire Tribute Commercial, The End, Fallen, Eye for a Tooth, Blood and Guts, Bullets and Bullets Reanimated. Uh, Streets of the Dead trailer. They did the Cirque de Terror trailer or commercial. The one that you may remember um, that I had mentioned before was uh, Welcome to My Dark Side, Women in Horror documentary. Um, Little Miss Muffin, Zombie Attack, Miss Misery's Monster Mash, Sally, Last Date, and Creepy Kofi Movie Time. Now, Renya, Miss Misery, as I will call her, as she is most famously known for, she's been at this for a while. And one of the things that I really admire about her work is the tenacity that she puts into it. Again, one of the biggest things when it comes to uh, low-budget, micro-budget productions is you hear a lot of people talk about doing them. Miss Misery goes out, and she actually does it. And she's put together... Uh, a fun anthology. Again, it seems like the the anthology style of, of filmmaking is starting to become more and more popular again, and Miss Misery has certainly jumped on this. Let me give you the synopsis for the film. Newly divorced Maggie, played by Connie Jo Seacrest, has a few unexpected guests in her new home scaring her to the bone, or are they trying to tell her something? A babysitting job for Claire, played by Kelsey Zukowski, may not be such a good idea with a serial killer on the loose. Want to be an actress? Sounds good until you end up being the director's obsession. Poor Shannon, played by Miss Misery, will have to learn the hard way. Three bone-chilling tales in the vein of Creepshow and Tales from the Crypt, directed by Renya Young. Uh, as I had mentioned, welcome to my dark side, doll murder spree. Um, Miss Misery, of course, wrote the screenplay and directed it, produced it, uh, produced it alongside John Gillette and Ken Constantine. The movie stars Alex Bretto, Kelsey Zukowski, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing this name right, Wise Crankfield, Maureen Whalen, Harold uh, Whitson, Andrew Stone, of course, Miss Misery, Connie Jo Seacrest, Shotzi Blackheart, C. 
Sarah Wallace, Judy Sereda, and Elisa Bastiani, Greg Russell Titerington, Slam and Sam, Jean Lady Sage, Jerry Munoz, and Monique Vandeplas. And again, you know, it's it's definitely in that anthology style. Um, you know, the first tale, of course, Maggie with Connie Josie Kristen apart, has moved into a new place. And right away she starts to notice things going on, like, you know, clothes being moved, objects being moved. A couple of times she thinks she sees people out of the corner of her eye, especially in a rocking chair in her living room. And her landlord drops by a couple of times, and you definitely get the, the creepy landlord vibe off of this guy. And, she, you know, she asks him if anything, you know, if anyone's ever been murdered in this house. And, of course, he says no. Well, Maggie starts to become more and more suspicious and actually talks to um, a police officer about the situation. As the story goes on, Maggie continues to see more of the spirits and more of the odd happenings around the house. And the question truly becomes, is is she being haunted by a malevolent spirit, or are the spirits trying to tell her something, trying to warn her of a danger? Needless to say, in the conclusion of the first story, Maggie finds out what's going on and finds out that the dead are not always the bad guys in the situation. Um, I thought it was a really done, well done piece. Uh, I liked the location that they fim- filmed in. I thought Connie was fantastic in the role of Maggie. I know sometimes it could be a little hard acting against something that's not initially there, but I thought her reactions to everything were really spot on, and it was a really fun and enjoyable segment. The second story um, that involves Kelsey Zukowski, who I've had as uh, one of my deadly beauty talents on Horror Society, uh, stars as Claire, and she gets a babysitting job. And her friend doesn't want her to go out on this babysitting job, but she goes anyway. What's been in the news is that there have been several women in the area that have been brutally murdered by a serial killer. Well, Claire decides to take the job anyway and falls asleep while babysitting, and the phone rings several times. And eventually she finds out that there is an intruder in the house. And one of the things that I really liked about this segment, and I've always liked this about Kelsey as an actress anyway, is just how badass her character is. She doesn't play the typical, you know, good looking, faint headed, you know, oh my God, woman in distress type film or type character. She definitely stands up on her own and does a fantastic job of defending herself against her attacker. Uh This segment in particular has quite a nice bit of brutality to it, again showing how strong Kelsey and her character truly are. Needless to say, uh, the final battle between her and her attacker winds up to be an amazing bloody mess and eventually ties in with the rest of the film. The third story that Miss Misery stars in is she plays an actress named Shannon. And one of the interesting side points to this is when Shannon goes to her her audition, she runs into Kelsey on the street just asking for general street directions. So this shows you that there's a, a tie between all of these stories. Well, she winds up going to this audition and meets this actor or this director, who's just a really creepy guy. Um, Very touchy-feely. He's the kind of guy that if you went out for a film audition, you damn sure wouldn't call the guy back, and you wouldn't agree to work with him. And and that's a credit to the young man who was playing the director. He definitely gives off that 
that vibe of, of someone who's slimy and has something else going on behind the scenes. Well, Shannon auditions for the part, and he becomes extremely enamored with her. After the audition, Shannon meets up with her boyfriend or husband. It's never really said which one he is, but it turns out he's the police officer that Maggie was talking to in the first segment of the film. And after Shannon kind of talks about, you know, what a creepy guy he was, and he offers to go and talk to the director, and she just kind of brushes it off. No, no, you know, don't worry about it. As we see the next day, this guy continues to call her, you know, over 40 messages, emails, things like that. And you see him at his computer basically looking at pictures of her like he was stalking her and talking to the computer. Well, Shannon decides to basically ignore the guy and winds up getting uh, an email for another audition for another film. So she dismisses this first guy without a thought. She heads off to go to this new audition. She doesn't realize that he is following her, and it appears that he sent this email for the fake audition just so he has a purpose to follow her and know what she's doing. Later on, Shannon, after she doesn't find the place, she goes and drops lunch off um, to to her significant other. And during that sequence, we see Maggie come in and remark about what's going on at the cabin. And she asks about the missing women that are featured up on the bulletin board. Later on, Shannon goes home. She gets a knock on the door, and it's the guy who had her in for the audition. So he eventually forces his way in, and things work themselves out from there. Overall, I really enjoyed the tone of this film. I liked how Renya did subtle things to intertwine the story so that there was a thread of connection. There's, you know, there's a small piece that, that, that ties them all together. I don't want to give away the ending of each of the segments. I think that's the fun part of the film. I enjoyed the acting. I really thought that everyone brought their characters together the way they needed to in these shorts. Now, again, this is shot on micro-budget, so when you watch it, you need to, to realize that's what's gonna, what it's going to look like, but I think that helps with the film. If you're going into this looking specifically for something like Creepshow or Tales from the Crypt, you're not going to get that same visual style. One of the things that I thought was a really strong element of this film as well was the sound mix. Some people may, may think that it was a little bit too drowned out, but I really felt like Miss Misery really brought the sound effects and <clears throat> excuse me, the sound the sound outlay really brought the, the the movie to life. There were several points where the music actually, you know, made the hair on my arm stand up a little bit. So I really feel like it brought a lot to the table. Um, if you're looking to pick this film up, according to the press release, SGL Entertainment has picked up distribution for Forgotten Tales. Um, it will be available in the U.S. and Canada on Blu-ray, DVD, Comcast Infinity, Cable TV, and the top VOD sites like iTunes, Amazon Prime, Google Play, MGO, and more in early 2016 via SGL Entertainment and their partners MVD Digital, Digi Visual and Indie Rights Distribution. SGL Entertainment is headed up by Jeffrey A. Swanson and Damian Dante with Mesa Molino, I hope I pronounced that right, Sirachi, handling foreign distribution. Overall, I would give the anthology a three out of five. I found it to be very entertaining, and I think there's a lot to be said for that. I truly admire Miss Misery's determination to keep putting out product and making herself one of the women in horror that you need to watch. So make sure to head on over to Last Doorway Productions, look at everything she's doing, pick up this film when it's available. We should be supporting independent art more and more, and one of these days, I'm telling you, Miss Misery is going to be one of these women that, that it's going to seem like she came out of nowhere when I've been telling you guys for years 
this is someone that you need to watch. So make sure to head out and pick up your copy of Forgotten Tales. Coming up in about five minutes, we're going to go into our feature interview with the fine, fine people of Murder in the Dark. We're going to have on director Dagan Merrill, producer, writer Doc Wyatt, and actress Mary Kate Wiles, all from the film that is part of the After Dark Horror Fest, Eight Films to Die For. But before that, we're going to go into our second Metal Massacre Spotlight. The name of the song, or name of the band is Battle Cross. The name of the CD is Rise to Power, and the song is Despised. Tonight's interview 
we are going to be discussing Dagan Merrill's film that is part of the After Dark Horror Fest Eight Films to Die For. And that film is Murder in the Dark. I'm currently joined by one of my guests this evening. Hello, guest. Who do I have with Hello. me? Hello. I'm uh, Doc Wyatt. I'm producer of Murder in the Dark. Okay, and I just had a second to join us. We've got Doc, and who else do we have with us? Uh, this is Dagan, the director. Is it? How, is that how you pronounce it? Is it Dagan? Dagan? Dagon, like dragon without Dagon. the R. Okay, okay. Just wanted to make sure. It's hard when you're communicating with uh, reps from eight films and, and you're not, you know, no one tells you the uh, the correct pronunciation through email. It's it's a little hard that way. But, guys, I want to welcome you to the show. Um, Mary Kate should Thank be you. joining us at some point this evening. I really find this to be an interesting film. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate you guys for being a part of the eight films to die for. And, oh, it looks like Mary Kate's with us. So it looks like we have all three. Mary Kate, are you there? Hi. 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 So now we have everybody. Hi. Hi. Sorry, I'm late. <laughs> it's, no, you're not late. You're you're here right at the beginning. Everything is, is all good. It's going to be an hour of fun, I can tell you that. Oh, good. Okay, what is up? How are you? Good. Good to hear your voice. Yeah, likewise. Now, one of the things I wanted to ask you guys, um, first and foremost, is out of all of the eight films to die for, and keep in mind, I'm getting my information from IMDb and, and places like that, so if a date is wrong or something, please feel free to correct me. But your film appears to be the, uh, for lack of a better term, the oldest film to be a part of the series. Um, completion was in sometime in 2013 from what I've been able to find. Was there a tactical reason for you guys waiting this long to release the film? Well, there's completion and there's completion. Uh, we um, we spent a long time in post-production on the picture, uh, due to the nature of, do you know about uh, about the way in which it was filmed? From everything that I read about the film, it was done in a little bit more of an experimental style of filmmaking. Uh, first and foremost, from what I've read, um, the cast never got to read the script. That's right. Yeah, that's exactly right. Dagan uh, and I conceived the story together, and we wrote it out in a treatment format. And then we uh, we blocked it by uh, we built a little model of the of, we filmed in some actual ruins in Italy and we built a, a, a sort of model of the ruins uh, which we visited on a location scout and then we plotted out the, um, the 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 course that the the physical filming would take through the ruins uh, because our goal was the experiment was to try to lead a troop of actors through the murder mystery by giving them only the clues that they needed to solve that mystery uh, as they were going, <laughs> with, without them exposing them to the script. Uh, which means right. that we had to have uh, multiple units. Like at one point, we had uh, five separate units, um, and uh, we uh, sort of crawling around the... Um, the ruins uh, of this uh, old medieval Italian village. And, um, you know, we wound up with a sort of a mountain of footage, more like you would come back from having made a documentary. So carving through that took uh, took more than a year. And then uh, we also uh, had some technical problems with audio that cost almost another year. So uh, the, the experiment itself became so post-production intensive that... Uh, we uh, it took a long time to get to the finishing line. Now, we're, we're, I'm going to go with this thread for a minute about, you know, the actors not seeing the script. Mary Kate, let me ask you this. As, as an actress, and, and you've definitely, you know, you've done several films, you've done several projects, so you are definitely yeah. someone that I would consider to be a seasoned actress. Oh, thank when, you. First, First of all, how were you approached for the film, and then what were your initial thoughts when you were told that you couldn't look at the script? <laughs> well, 
Well, it was odd. I will say, since this was such a long time ago, it was actually only my second feature film at the time. Now I've done, I don't know, five or six. Um, So I was still relatively new to just making films in general, but um, it certainly was unlike anything I had ever done and probably will ever do again. I I feel bad because after I got the part, which I really enjoyed auditioning for it because it was all improv um, in the audition, and I hadn't really gotten a chance to do very much of that yet in my career, and I really enjoyed that. Um, but after I got the part, and they kind of sort of explained what was happening, which, of course, like when you first see the project and you're like, shoot's in Italy, oh, wow, yes, please, I would love to go to Italy. And then we were all kind of like, are they going to, like, take us over there and kill us? <laughs> and poor well, Jaden, you know, it, I, I put him through go. the ringer with, like, what are, okay, I won't do this, I will do this, I'm really scared of stuff, like, don't put me in any scary situations. I don't know if you remember, Dagan. I asked him a lot of questions. <laughs> and I was really kind of on the, the, go ahead. I'm saying, yeah, you you did, and it was a strange place to be. Had to see someone who had all these questions, and I had, I had a lot, many assurances, but no actual answers. I think you were very patient with me. I really was kind of on the fence about it because I was just like unsure and a little scared. Um, but now, of course, I'm so glad that I did that because it was such a different and interesting experience that I doubt I will have again, and I learned a lot from it. You know, with with the very little acting that I've done in in my sparse career, you know, mm-hmm. it's hard enough sometimes to to give the director what it is that they want on camera. And for you, Mary Kate, with all of this being improv and and kind of being led, you know, you know how how intuitive was it for you with scenes? You know, I mean, it's. I know, like, a lot of times the director will tell you, you know, don't look at the camera, you know, look here, look there. When you guys were setting up scenes and you were acting against your fellow actors and actresses, you know, kind of talk about how you tried to move the narrative along and and how was dialogue with something where you couldn't read a script? I mean, so I believe we shot for nine days. I may be wrong. Correct me, guys, if I'm wrong. The first, like, three days were just completely, like, going through the story. And it really wasn't – it wasn't like acting in a normal, like, camera – acting for camera situation. It was more like, A, a play, because, uh, honestly, I don't really even feel like there was much of, like, oh, be sure and be here when this happens or whatever, because they were just letting things happen to us. They would sort of stop us if something needed to happen – we actually had like a whistle system where you guys would whistle and everybody would freeze and you would come up and like whisper in our ear um, certain yeah, I, things I can that jump we needed in there. to do. Please, uh, Just please to jump do. in to explain that real quick. I mean, so we developed, please, please. Chris and I, and we, we developed what we called the freeze and whisper system. So our, our goal was to see how much they could discover on their own, how little information we could give them. We just wanted to give them circumstantial information. We wanted them to experience the space and each other. And they each had a secret. We wanted that to come up naturally. But from time to time, if we felt like it needed to go a certain direction, we would uh, we would blow a whistle. Initially, we tried just to do it with, like, some sort of verbal command, but oftentimes conversations and, and dialogue would become so heated we would need a whistle to kind of get over yelling voices. So we'd blow this whistle, and the, and at that moment, everyone would freeze exactly where they were and hopefully stay in their exact emotional state, at which point either Chris or I would walk over to one of them and we'd whisper something in their ear. And our intention was never to say, hey, do this or do that, but rather to give them to give them an intention, to give them some sort of feeling or some sort of emotion that might arise naturally in the situation. So the idea being that could we let this drama and this mystery play forward with only kind of manipulating and, 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 and directing the intentions and the emotions and the feelings of each actor. And it wasn't, a, it wasn't always perfect, but a lot of times it worked surprisingly well. 
We would well, give Megan, them, for example, each each actor would have their own secret about their character that other people didn't know. For example, we had two of the characters, and I don't want to ruin it for people who haven't seen it, but two of the characters have a relationship that's surprising that isn't alluded to um, uh, overtly. And so only only those actors knew about that secret relationship until we forced it to come to a head through the way we manipulated the plot, if you understand what I mean. Sure. Now, Dagan, uh, let me ask you this. As, as a director... You know, um, you know, a lot of the directors that I've worked with, you know, it's very precise. You know, we want this certain emotion. We want, you know, we want this certain look. We want, you know, this certain pan and things like that. With this whole experimental way of shooting the film, you know, did you did you have an idea in your head how difficult that may be for the actors and the actresses? And on the same token. Did you, you know, it seems like with everyone not knowing what the secret was that everyone had and what was going to happen, did you did you feel like you got most of the emotional responses that you wanted from your actors and actresses? It's a good question. You know, it was it was for me going into it. I I'm actually historically very con- I don't want to say controlling, but very specific <laughs> director. And so for me to go into this as an experiment was part of for my my process was to liberate myself from that to some degree and to really kind of surrender to the talent of the actors and what they had to bring to the table and i have to say to the talent of the co-filmmakers i mean this is a very small crew uh doc who co-wrote it with me is was absolutely vital every step of the way as was Every, everyone out there was a com, was a complete filmmaker through and through, so there was a lot of letting go of of control and a lot of trusting the actors to find their thing. So, so yeah, I guess to answer your question is it wasn't always it wasn't always perfect what I would expect, but um, but the, that was there was a trade off to where there was lots of surprises that I could never have come up with on my own or by myself. A quick example is there's kind of that 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 kind of horror trope, which is, you know, you get a certain amount of characters together, things have been going bad, and then they all say, hey, why don't we split up? And then they get killed off one by one. Well, I think right. Doc and I have kind of, you know, probably out of just, I don't know exactly why, but we had come to a point where, yeah, we had these four, the, the, the remaining certain number of characters and our idea was let's get them to kind of split off and we can kind of work work through the next murder. But what happened, the actors sat there, they got together in a huddle and said, looked at each other in the eye and said, nobody's leaving this circle no matter what. <laughs> no one wanted... and, so we, and, so we, like, and so we could have had a choice at that moment to say, whisper in someone's ear, oh, you have to leave or something like that. But we didn't. Instead, we, we kind of, pulled back, and I remember talking to Doc about it and saying, you know, this is a choice they made. It's made it very naturally. Now what do we do? And so we had to solve a problem, and it was, and so it was a unique situation where we're solving problems based on their reality, the, the, the character's realities, versus kind of what we want to have happen. So it was a, it was a trade-off. You know, sometimes you, you it wasn't always a win, but sometimes stuff like that happened. And, and what came next out of that was one of the more exciting Twists, I think, of the movie, which happened because of character decisions. Now, Doc, I'll, you know, I, I wanted to ask you. You know, I, I was looking over your, your filmography, um, and I looked at a lot of stuff that you had done as a writer. And of course, you've done a lot of stuff with Marvel. You know, with the the Avengers uh, uh, Assemble TV series, you know, cartoon, and and you've done some work with. Um, what was it, uh, Spider-Man and Transformers and all of that. And, um, you know, it was, you know, very linear style of writing. Again, you know, when when you want something on the screen, you know, it's very specific. For <clears throat> you being the writer for this, you know, what led to you wanting to go with this experimental style of writing when you had already fleshed out the story and kind of what you had already wanted? Um, I mean, uh, 
Well, well, first of all, I think that there is a, you know, television writing, I think, is a little different than writing for film, um, especially weekly television where you're you're in a writer's room. Like um, on those series, the Marvel shows, uh, Avengers Assemble and Ultimate Spider-Man, we have story summits where we get into a room with a, a, a bunch of writers and it's supervising advising producers, my, my partner and I, my producing partner and I, will bring in like a synopsis of a story and, you know, this is the story we want to tell and these are the outcomes we want to get. And then we'll run a writer's room. We'll just start putting stuff up on the board and we'll start breaking the story with the, with the other writers. And so, and oftentimes you'll find that that premise that you brought into it will take some surprising twists and turns as you're breaking it with the, with the uh, other writers and as you're putting it on the board. And that's honestly not that much different than what we did with Murder in the Dark. Um, Dag and I had a pretty thorough, about a, about a 20 or 30 page document that had all the beats in uh, that we wanted to hit. And then once we put the cast up on that mountain, um, you know, it was like a cliff city that you had to hike into each morning and had no running water or electricity. So, we had to bring any lights that we used. We shot on 5Ds, uh, you know, uh, very portable cameras, and we brought in some light panels that were LED, battery-powered LED light panels, and uh, basically we had camping toilets, uh, you know, hidden in just out of <laughs> just out of view all around the ruins, and, uh, and that was it. And we'd hike in each morning, and then we'd put the story up on its feet, and it was a lot like being in a writer's room, like you – you throw out what you think they're going to do, and then they start to go in some new directions. And uh, sometimes it's not working, and you have to rein them back in. And sometimes it plays out like you imagined, and sometimes it takes you places you didn't imagine. Now, in in, in terms of that, you know, um, is, is, is Mary Kate going to talk about the, uh, the 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 quarter toilets? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I had completely forgotten about them until you just mentioned them. I think I've lost them from my memory. <laughs> All right. Anyway, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> with that, with that element that you're talking about, sometimes you know they did things unexpected, and, and, and you know you got you know you had certain things planned out. You know, were you ever like truly? surprised by a reaction or something that one of the actors or the group of actors did that completely blew you away and changed a major element of the story? Well, I don't think any major plot element uh, altered. A couple of subplots that we had planned wound up getting dropped, uh, but Mm -hmm. some red herrings that we planted just didn't, didn't... didn't really wind up like they didn't ever notice the red herring, and so that, that sort of whole subplot got got abandoned. But uh, you know, we didn't um, major plot developments didn't change. What really changed was the characters, the way they shaped their emotions and their reactions to what was happening around them. And, and I think we were surprised by that in a lot of ways. Um, well, I remember one one moment in particular that sticks out to me. And it was with Mary Kay, and she was with an, another actress during a scene at Mary's Liquor. It was the first time we had gone through the story, which was on day like probably day three or day two. And it's a big, it's a big reveal, a big plot shift. And they're walking through this abandoned ruin, and they come around a corner and they discover something that is it's really it's it's pretty shocking and and what's great is we had it covered in such a way that that initial moment of just discovery the camera's 100% on Mary Kate's face it's a great close up it's in focus and we get this moment which is not it's obviously her she's acting but it's also just that there's kind of something very it's a one take thing and and there's this moment of discovery and horror that's captured that ended up in the final film that I don't uh yeah, for me it was a real victory for the system. That um that moment is actually what I really took away from the whole process and when I talk about it that's what I talk about because like I don't know, it was really interesting as an actor to sort of be in a situation where you are not allowed to prepare and things are just happening to you and you're reacting, which is what acting is supposed to be, is reacting. 
Um, but, like, I believe we did that shot. If we're thinking about there are a couple times where it's, like, some things were surprising to me. Um, and the time that I was thinking of really, like, scared me. And um, so we did it. And then we had to go back and do it again. And I couldn't really recreate that. I just couldn't recreate. You can't really do that. Like, there's something about being surprised for the first time for real that you just can't completely recreate as an actor, which I thought was really interesting. And I really, like, love that I had that experience. I took a lot away from it in terms of just how I approach things. You know, and I was getting ready to ask you about that, Mary-Kate, you know, in addition to what I like to call the Scooby-Doo mentality where they all break off into groups and go do their own thing, you know, you know, you guys had kind of decided, you know, in that circle that, you know, you weren't going to do that. When you guys were put in situations where you guys had one idea and, you know, Doc's script and, and, and Doggins' ideas of of what he wanted – went against the grain of, of what you guys were thinking as, as a group mentality. You know, how did you guys cope with that? And, you know, you, you kind of touched on it, but I wanted to ask you also, you know, you talked about that moment of surprise. And mm-hmm. they're going to talk about, um, you know, holding your emotion when the whistle blew. You know, how do you maintain that level of emotion, that level of energy when you guys needed to stop so that things could be pointed in the direction that they were looking for? I mean, I don't, I I feel like that, I don't know, as an actor, you kind of have to learn to live in those places because even in, you know, traditional filmmaking, you have to do take after take after take of, you know, like the saddest moment of your life. So you right. have to like learn to keep that alive. Um, although I don't, I don't know. I don't really remember any, like, I feel like any time they stopped us for whatever reason, it was always very quick. I mostly just remember a lot of Doc, like, running around and, stuff. <laughs> and like, <laughs> whispering things and then running out. And they really were working hard to ensure that, like, they didn't, you know, trip us up in any way, but, but like, fostered what was happening with us. And then, of course, like, made sure that we ultimately like did what needed to be done um but yeah and of course like i feel like we had a very good ensemble and always that is a huge factor is as long as you are working with actors that you trust and we did a lot of trust exercises before we went there you know that was very important in terms of just making sure we all worked together well that was one thing we wanted them to be a very cohesive ensemble and uh, you know, Dagan was particularly vocal about that. The idea that we didn't we didn't have that many shooting days. We didn't have a lot of resources. We had to get a very, very, very shoestring budget production all the way to Europe uh, and get in and get out very quickly. And so we didn't have time for their their chemistry to gel uh, on set on location. Uh, and mm-hmm. so we did seven weeks of rehearsals where Dagan would, uh, you know, but here's the thing. We can't, well, how do you rehearse if you can't show them the script, right? So what we, we did initially is Dagan would invent um, uh, a lot of uh, improv scenarios, and then we'd try to rehearse them as a troupe just so that they could get their energy and their ensemble together. And then eventually what we did is we gave them dossiers that we'd written on each of their characters. And so they started to get to know their characters and their relationships to one another uh, and we rehearsed them improving as those characters almost in prequels to the, to the film itself. Um, and then we did what we, we termed a dress rehearsal where we took them up in the, uh, up in the Malibu state park at, in some mountains and just ran the, the equivalent of a short film to test the, the, you know, the, the stop and uh, the whistle system. Um, and uh, so we wound up doing seven weeks of rehearsal without without showing anyone a single page of a script. Hmm. Now, when you guys were actually on set, um, and I think this is a, a good question, not only for experienced filmmakers, but um, independent filmmakers looking to break in. When you guys were out there on set, you know, how long was a typical day? Because Because everything was so improvisational, 
it, it must have been hard to look at the script and go, okay, we want to go, we want to shoot scenes A, B, C, D, you know, so on. You know, how was that, and how long were days on sets? Um, I'm not. I don't. I remember feeling like we never left set, but I think <laughs> we stuck. We we stuck to a, a, a SAG. Re- I mean, because we had SAG actors, we we uh, we abided sure. by SAG regulations with getting there and getting from. Um, so so we did just we did normal hours while we sat. Now initially, I had proposed that we would go up there and spend three straight days and nights and film all together. But in the end, that uh, that would have been just really miserable. Right. I, I like hotels. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I remember one of the things that was a little bit frustrating was the fact that we, we couldn't find lodging within, uh, I think it was a 45-minute drive every morning. So we we lost an hour and a half of our day just in travel each day. But, mm. uh, but I, so I, I, wasn't sure, I, mean, I guess I'm not sure exactly what the question was. Like for other filmmakers... Well, you know, it's it's like like I said, you know, for for most filmmakers, you have uh, um, on, at least sets that I've been on, sets that I've worked on, you know, there was a very rigid, you know, we need to get fifteen scenes in, okay, and we need to be here by this time, and we need to be here by that time. With with the improvisational nature of the film, you know, did you find it easy to stay on your schedule? And that's why I was asking how long your shooting days were. Do you feel like? Had everyone read the script and knew the linear plot straight out the gate, do you think filming would have gone faster? Do you, you know things like that? I guess is, it, that's kind of what I'm asking: is do you feel like the days took longer to yeah. shoot because of the improvisational manner? No, no we I think mean, they went. Go ahead. Doc. Sorry, go ahead, Dagan. I just well, I, say... per- <laughs> <laughs> I think this is a lot faster. like what it was like. This is what it was like being an actor on set. Just yeah. me and Doc just stepping on each other all day long. <laughs> I, I so it was like a regular film set. We then. didn't. We shot it like a uh, documentary, so we didn't. They didn't stop. We didn't do when we shot the first run through, which was the first three days, which was mm-hmm. real time. You know, for the characters, they were on that on in those ruins on top of that cliff for three days, and we shot those three days in three days. So we ran it like a documentary, where we didn't. We didn't. We would freeze and whisper to give them, you know, pieces of character information uh, or course corrections where they needed. But generally speaking, a minute for the character was a minute for the actor. Um, so, okay. it, you know, we, it was sort of straight through. It was like living a life. Uh, and, yeah. you know, they, they ate lunch kind of like in character. Play. So, yeah, they had lunches and they ate lunch in character. They never broke character. They For, for the time we were on set, once they left the van in the morning until we were back in the van, they stayed in character. So, yeah, and, and so to answer your question, the answer is yes. It was easier to be on schedule because when the sun went down, the day was over, and then we went home. Like no matter what happened that day, and and we had made for the first three days when we were running through it live, so to speak, we were very determined not to do any retakes, no take twos, no like oh let me reposition the camera. We really tried to stay out of the way of the actors um, as much as we possibly could. So. I just, just find that absolutely something. fascinating that you guys put together a movie like that. I mean, most filmmakers I know would be pulling their damn hair out at the end of the first day. <laughs> well, well, some of that didn't happen. <laughs> I think, too, one of the things – well, there's two things to consider. First of all, we had a really uh, gifted cinematographer named Timothy Burton who who shot for us, and and, and other camera people who were really, really talented, including Kevin Burke, who shot. And the idea with them, what we said is like, look, we're shooting this like a documentary, but we don't want it. To, we want this to be a film. We want it to feel cinematic. We we don't want it to feel like running gun. We don't want it to feel like mumblecore. We want it to feel like a cinematic experience. And that was their challenge. And so yeah, like while the actors were just in their space, living minute to minute you had a production crew that was busting their tail to get around and to get cinematic shots and to find everything, and including a produ- production design unit that was always having to stay a step ahead of stuff that we didn't necessarily know was going to happen, all in this abandoned city. So it was it was easy from a schedule perspective, but like I said, this team of filmmakers that we brought with us were beyond exceptional. Every single one of them 
were just beyond exceptional. And then the second thing to consider as an independent filmmaker is that, yeah, we walked away each day. And, in fact, I, we did shoot nine days, but I remember on the, the final day, about halfway through, we said, well, we're, we're done. We have nothing else to shoot here. Like, we were that done. But that, that economy of storytelling was so exciting and just so, for me, compelling. But the pain and torture of the post-production process was equally as painful as, as that was economic, if that makes sense. It does, yeah, and, and we're certainly going to touch on post-production here in a moment, but one of the other things I wanted to bring up for sure was your location. You know, I watched the trailer. I've seen a bunch of stills from it. I have not, unfortunately, been able to see the films. After Dark has been very tight on letting screeners out because they want to keep the surprise for the October 16th release. But one of the things that I noticed was the locations, the ruins themselves. Absolutely stunning, and if I may, from a visual standpoint, um, it reminded me a lot of Armando de uh, Sorio's Tombs of the Blind Dead from 1970. You know, where the Knights Templar are in, the, in, in that like that ruined castle area. That's very yeah. much what the location of the film reminded me of. Kind of tell me a little bit about that location and how you guys came about choosing it for the filming. Google Maps helped a lot. Right, Jackie? Really? Well, it's interesting because this is – we had seen photos. Just like, It was one of those things like abandoned places or something, and this was at a point where no one had identified – we saw a photo of a place, and we had no idea where it was, but both Doc and I were just fascinated by this photo. And so by, by kind of – it was one of these places that – it was kind of on some rumor site that someone had hiked to kind of a thing. And so uh, we we could end up triangulating more or less where it was based on where these people live that had seen it and take some photos of it. But someone would give out the GPS coordinates. And so I ended up we ended up getting on Google Earth, by triangulating this area and just kind of doing di- visual uh, kind of like virtual flyovers until we found it. Um, and then once we knew where it was, Doc and I. And, uh, well, we had a trip up there for a film festival for another film we had together. And so we just made the, the six-hour drive or so, went down and just walked up to it. What did you find to be the most interesting aspect of that location? Like, were there areas that you looked at that didn't make it into the film? Oh, man, well, let me let me tell you about the location. First of all, it, it's a city called Craco, C-R-A-C-O, in southern Italy, a region called Basilicata. And it uh, was uh, an ob- it was an old Norman city built around the year 1000, and mm. continuously inhabited until about 19 until the late 1980s, when the some movement on the cliffs got so bad that houses were cracking in half and splitting in half. And uh, you see some of them in the movie. You'll see houses that are, that are sort of half missing or houses that are separated like cleft in two. And it got so dangerous that the uh, that the government forbade the people from living there anymore. They they forced them, they forcibly removed them from their homes for safety reasons. Um, and they built sort of this bunker like <laughs> it's like a Mussolini era looking a military bunker compound to replace the beautiful ancient uh, houses that they were living in. And they were uh, uh, you know upset because there were. Um, uh, you know, there were people who were very wealthy because they owned, uh, a, you know, there were real estate barons owning a lot of plots of this Italian cliff city that then they suddenly can't use and, and it's declared an un, uninhabitable. So there were some very upset people. None of this we knew, by the way. When we show up in Italy and we make a deal with the mayor to shoot there, and a couple of other films had shot there. I think that one single shot from Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ used it in the background and there were a couple of Italian films that had filmed in the ruins. But when we showed up, we made an agreement with the mayor and we had to pay a certain amount of money and then we had to hire some people to um, to remove vipers. There were viper problems in the ruins. We didn't tell the actors about that. Uh, sorry, Mary Kate. No, you, you sure didn't. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, so we, we thought we were all good. And then the first day of production, 
we start to shoot the first shot, the first day where we, we were so excited because the actors have never even seen the location. And they pull it. The actor driving the van is actually driving it. And he pulls up to see the ruins for the first time. And we're filming them getting off the van, seeing this location for the first time. And all of a sudden, um, coming storming into to frame is a, a, a car of a local Italian villager who's upset that we're able to shoot on the land. And he starts screaming, and there are protesters, and things get really intense to the point where, you know, uh, we, at a certain point in production, this was a few days in, we actually had uh, a, uh, a horde of angry peasants with uh, farming implements storming up the cliff to disrupt production. Um, oh, wow. Which was, you know, very upsetting. Now, Mary-Kate, for you, you know, location can mean everything in, in a shoot. When you when you guys first saw the location, what were your initial thoughts? I mean, we were like just overwhelmed and flabbergasted. It's unbelievable. It's still the most amazing place I've ever been in my life, and I feel so lucky that we were able to shoot there. I mean, it is gorgeous, and once you're up there, like at the top of you know this abandoned village which itself is amazing you can just see for miles and it's gorgeous um our first impressions were like oh wow how beautiful and then oh my god these people are yelling what's happening everything's in a <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh thankfully that was all handled and it all ended up being fine but yeah i mean it was incredible and it was really i mean we did have to sort of pack up and go home at night because you know it, it's so dark and there's like nothing there but I remember we did a a few shots as it was getting dark and it's just so still and like I I can't remember my character was like going somewhere and I was so creeped out by it because it's just so old and so quiet and so dark and you're like ah there's definitely ghosts in here but you know that was like great that we had that that we like had that feeling of like both like uh, sort of awe and a little bit of terror mixed in there. It was perfect for us. Now, how did you guys wind up resolving the issues with the townspeople? Did they eventually just go away, or was it a daily occurrence where they would interrupt shooting? No, we. it was a problem for a while, and it, we didn't know any of the backstory. And uh, So at first we just thought people were – we couldn't understand why people were upset, and then – once we understood uh, what was happening, that they they were actually the people whose families had owned these houses and who had lived there as children were, you know, forbidden from going into the city. It was off limits. Uh, and so they couldn't go to their ancestral homes and see the places where they were born. Yet, the, you know, the mayor let some idiots from L.A. like shoot a horror movie there. So once we understood why the the dynamics of why everyone was so upset, uh, we just sat down at the table and and we made a deal. We wound up hiring a rotating group of locals to provide meals uh, to cast and crew. And so we went, by the end of production, we would break for meals and um, uh, and uh, go uh, go to somebody's house and usually sit in their, like, sort of open-air backyard area in this sort of Italian farmhouse and eat um, these meals that they prepared, which were delicious and usually made of goat. Um, yeah. and, I mean, some uh, of the best, you know, the best food in the world. I mean, the pasta in that region, the food in that region is just incredible. So I just have to add, I mean, it was, it was amazing food. Yeah, it was. That's pretty cool, though, that you guys eventually worked it out and then and, – you know, being able to soak, uh, sample local cuisine, especially in a foreign country like that, I mean, that had, that had to be a great boon for you guys as well. The other film that I felt like, and again, I, I certainly mean this as a compliment, the other tone that I get from the film, both stylistically <clears throat> and architecturally, um, it, it came across a lot to me like Eli Roth's Hostel as well. Now, just basing what I've seen from the trailer, I, I'm not, I'm definitely not calling the film a hostile clone or a hostile knockoff, but it definitely, you, you get that, that grim feeling from the trailer. Was, was hostile uh, somewhat of an inspiration for this film? 
Um, I mean, not, not really. I actually, I, I, I've, I've never seen Hostel, so I wouldn't know exactly. Uh, I mean, I saw, I've seen the trailers and stuff, and I and I certainly would love the success of Hostel to be an inspiration for this film. Um, but I haven't I haven't seen ho- any of the Hostels, uh, even though I, I, I respect the franchise. Yeah, I mean, we okay. uh, I haven't seen it yet either. But um, the, uh, what, the the sort of starting off point for us. Uh, was actually Agatha Christie. Um, you know, we, we're Dag and I are both Agatha Christie fans, and uh, we love you know the format that she sort of created. That sort of, and then there were none sort of uh, format. Um, you know, we we spend a lot of time talking about what would like an Agatha Christie movie be in this. You know, if there were a new Agatha Christie story, if the Dame was still with, with us, what would those stories be like? And we realized she'd be a horror writer. She'd be, you know, yes. um, you know, she'd be, she'd be sort of in the same class as Stephen King if she were still writing today. And so a lot of, um, you know, a lot of our choices were informed by, well, what do you think Angus Christie would want her characters to have to go through <laughs> uh, if she put them in this kind of circumstance? Well, again, and like I said, neither one of you having seen Hostel. Um, Mary Kate, have you seen the movie? No, I have not. I'm I'm actually really bad with scary movies. <laughs> I, I, I can't well, uh, handle them. I'll try to explain a little bit what I what I mean. Um, you know, just from from the trailer, from what I've seen, there are definitely there appear to be moments of 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 grimness. Um, I don't know how gruesome the film gets. The trailer shows a little bit of blood, and I want to touch on your effects artist here in a second as well. But you know. You know, when people watch this film, should they should they be expecting a fair amount of of blood and gore, or is it something that's much more implied to the mind? Yeah, can you there? Oh, is that, is that to me? Sorry, I was just. Um... It's 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 for any of you. I mean, it's it's into you know from yeah, you know, from Doc from a writer's is, standpoint actually... from the. Go ahead. We definitely want. There's definitely a. a an element of it, and I think it, I mean, it is, it, it can get quite gruesome, but it's kind of like Chris was saying, it, it's a murder mystery first, and that was one of the things, even editing it together and marketing it, is to try to figure out, like, yeah, where does it fit in the marketplace, and I don't know, Chris, what do you think? No, I think it's a little more Hitchcockian than it is torture porn. I mean, I think we, we have a couple of uh, shots that will curl a few toenails, but it's not a consistent battery of brutality. It's a little bit more, uh, yeah, Hitchcock, but maybe late Hitchcock, around frenzy. Now, tell me a little bit about how you guys met your effects artist, Joanna Jenkins. Um, well, she was she's uh, someone we knew socially through my producing partner, Jamie Burke, uh, who produced the film with me. Uh, they had worked together, and they were also friends and we're social uh, together, and we met that way. Uh, and she was fantastic. So I understand, I mean, Mary Kate, I guess, could confirm this for me, but I understand that she was uh, called the angel of death on set because whenever, <laughs> whenever you know, we try to, you know, they die, the, the sort of one by one, the characters are, are hunted and killed, and, um, uh, you know, they had to be prepped for makeup for that. So yeah, we, you didn't so, want uh, Joanna coming for you because you knew your time was up. You were like, no, no. Right. <laughs> See, now, to me, now that's a funny aspect because I got, when I first started in the industry, I started as a special effects artist. And, you know, the amount of prep time sometimes it takes for certain effects or certain looks, you know, for, from a director's standpoint, um, Dagan, let me ask you that, you know, with the characters not knowing what's going to happen to them, how did that factor into your shooting schedule? Yeah, well, I don't they, remember specifically, um, but what would happen, of course, to keep the easy, but I do know that to keep the mystery going, not people couldn't be, people had to be alone when they disappeared anyway. And so what, right. we, what we would do is we would we would do it. And remember, we had we have several different camera units going at once. But sometimes people would break off and no camera would follow them. I mean, 
a lot of times actors would make decisions and decide to go do something, and the cameras wouldn't go after them. So that we had a little bit of leeway that way as far as finding a, a kind of a time and a moment. So, you know, people would split up for whatever reason, and that's when Johanna would show up and say, hey, you need to come with me. And uh, and sometimes it was, you know, because they were dying, sometimes it was because they were going to get in some sort of scrape or, or something or there's some other injury. And so, but that, so we, we uh, you know, I... I like to say that we really plan in advance, but in a lot of ways, we just had to be very re- reactive and on and 100% on the ball. And that's where Johanna really. Sh- I mean, if you look at, I mean, the, the 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 effects work and the special effects and the makeup is, it's it's really really good. And she, and literally, a lot of these things were happening on the fly. I remember specifically, someone at one point we decided last second that someone's getting dragged across the ground. And she had to figure out within, you know, 15, 20 minutes how to do that believably but also safely. Right. She she brought with her two cases of wardrobe, uh, two cases of props, and that was it. And uh, when she arrived, she, she had a, a, a one art department uh, crew member, and we got her a, a borrowed Fiat. And she drove around uh, the Silicata in a Fiat gathering all the stuff we needed like a, you know, a pig fart at one point. Nice. Which is surprisingly <laughs> easy to procure in Italian farm country. <laughs> now, Mary-Kate, you know, for you, of course, now, I don't know what happens to your character, and I'm not asking you to spoil anything. But you had mentioned um, a few minutes ago, you know, you know you, you're you not so much on, on the horror films. You know, what were your thoughts on on the effects work and the blood in this film? Um, well, I also, I thought it was all great. Obviously, I don't know. Some people, sometimes people are like, you don't like scary movies, but you're in them. How? <laughs> it's like, well, making them is a lot different than watching them because, you know, you are there and you know that it is not real and it is easy to just play and have fun. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, she did such a great job, and I'm so excited to see how it all looks. And it was a lot of fun for us all. I mean, it was it was it was like a it was like a work game. We genuinely, all of us, were so invested in what was happening and trying to figure out what was going on. Really, truly, it was unlike anything I've ever done before, and I loved that. Like we really were. We would go home and be like, "Wait, so what happened? Did you talk to that person? Could it be this person? No." Like we were all trying to figure it out, and we uh, couldn't do it. We we loved that that they were still guessing. We we didn't even uh, Dagan didn't even tell the murderer who the murderer was. Nobody nobody knew even the murderer himself or herself until right before we we shot the scene that revealed it, and uh, Dagan pulled that uh, cast member aside and and told that person. So they got to speculate huh. each night, uh, you know. Of, uh, yeah. You know, I think I'm the killer. I think I'm. The... In fact, we had a stunt guy uh, on the crew uh, who was handsome and an actor, but came with us to crew and do stunts. And everyone was very suspicious of him. They figured, well, why would they have uh, an <laughs> actor on crew if he wasn't? You know, I think he's the killer, and it's not one of us. And we're going to find out it's this guy, and he shows up yeah. in the third act or something. We came up with a lot of theories. <laughs> Uh, none of them that I heard were correct, but I don't know. We were surprised. Now, before we talk about uh, post-production and, and some of the issues you guys had with that, um, Mary Kay, let me start with you on this. You know, being in a remote location like that, you know, the things that go on, you know, the remoteness, things like that, what did you, you know, what was the most difficult aspect of that being that far out for you, you know? <laughs> Oh, um, that's an interesting question. I mean, uh, I wouldn't. No, I don't know that I would categorize it as difficult beyond like having to pee in <laughs> little camp bodies. Um, right. You know, it it was nice. I don't know. In a lot of ways, we were so. It was just like camp. You know, we were all there together in a foreign country. We all bonded very quickly. Um, and it was almost over before we knew it because we only were there for a couple of weeks. So in, in a lot of ways, it was, it was great to sort of just, 
I don't know. I, I really enjoy um, going elsewhere to shoot things because when you're in LA, it's just very easy to like still be distracted with your life and everything going on. And it's really fun to go somewhere else and have to only focus on that one thing, not have all these other distractions going on. So um, I, I really enjoyed it. Now, Doc and Dagan, for you guys, you know, several of the other filmmakers I've had on from the eight films to die for, you mentioned the Vipers, of course. Uh, you know, the other crews have told me about you know dealing with wildlife, rain, um, the weather, whether it be hot or cold. You know, for you guys, just from a technical end, filming. You know, what did you guys find to be the most technically challenging aspect of filming? And and you know, did you guys have any problems with any of those conditions, like the weather, or you know, other than the Vipers and things like that? Well, the mob, mob of angry peasants. That was and there were there were goats one day. There were just like goats oh, roaming yeah, around. Goat <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> well, and, and there was a, that there was that uh, really creepy goat herder like uh, guy who used to steal children oh. on the black market that was wandering around. <laughs> yes, there was a kidnapper who sometimes would live in those in those ruins. Uh, they they called the villagers called him the shepherd. Because he would kidnap children and take them up there sometimes, and uh, so we 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 found I think a room we thought he was living in with these gnarly hooks on the wall and stuff, but we never oh. I think actually encountered the shepherd. No, the thing that was so spooky about it is what would happen is because he knew the ruins better than anyone, so we'd be wandering around. He'd come around a corner, and you know, and I never saw him except for the. But the very first day we were there on the scout, I saw him for one second. But the rest of the time, he was there, always close by. But because he knew the ruins better than everyone else, he never saw him. But he knew he got close, but sometimes he'd stumble around a corner. And I remember this happening to me because, you know, I'd be on a camera or something. And I'd, I'd go like, oh, here's a shot, and I'm going to wait for it. And all of a sudden, I realized I'm completely alone. And you turn, you come around a corner, and... He would have his jacket, his really big, old, gnarly, heavy jacket that was all ripped up and had blood stains from the goats on it. And it would, uh. be, sweet, and it would be swinging on a meat hook in a, in a corridor. And it was his way of warning me to, look, you've come close enough, don't come past this point. And I never did. I would never have gone past that. I mean, it was, that was truly terrifying, that guy. But he had some huh. real serious Also, less, less insidiously, uh, there was just tons of goat crap because uh, yeah. the goats would use the ruins as, um, you know, as like a grazing ground. And so there was this one room in particular where we wanted a lot of, uh, we wanted the actors uh, uh, to be able to lie down there uh, to simulate a pile of bodies. And uh, But to do that, we had to clean out like uh, 10 square feet of goat crap with uh, <laughs> these old, like, these old like straw brooms that these like farm brooms. It was a uh, it was like not the kind of producing cast you think you're gonna <laughs> do when you start producing your pizza. <laughs> uh. Now you guys talk about you had issues in in post production. Kind of talk about some of the issues that you guys faced when you were trying to finish the film and put it all together. Well, our, I will say our biggest single issue was at the time we were shooting on the 5D, and we were kind of at the at the, the bleeding edge of that technology. And at the time, there was no real great way to sync audio, um, and because of the way we were shooting, we didn't really have time or the ability to to do it correctly. So we came up with this idea that we could fix it in post using a, a program that I won't mention because it failed so spectacularly. Um, uh. And it did, it, because we got behind on that, we ended up with, I mean, that thousands of hours of footage that were not that had reference audio, but that were not synced up to our original audio. So ultimately, once we had the whole film together, we had to put in close to two, I think, two three hundred hours uh, for someone who knew the footage very well to go back in and to match it with uh, with with the visuals, and that was. It was a real mistake of uh, foresight, you know, trusting in a technology that proved itself on a small scale. Like, it worked fine when we were doing a few clips here and there. Like, oh, this is going to work. 
but when we brought it to such a large scale, the technology failed us absolutely. Hmm. Well, so that you was know, just one of the problems. I mean, the, I would say the other big thing was just the amount of footage. We have this one scene that I think turned out spectacularly, but realized we shot the movie three times more or less in, in sequence because we couldn't shoot in any other way than sequence because we didn't have enough costumes and resources. And so there's this one scene that I, I believe we ran either three or four times. It's a critical scene. So we would have four or five cameras filming continuously on it. The scene when we performed it live took on average 35 to 40 minutes. So you can imagine we times 40 times five cameras times four different times you go through and you end up, you're, you're, you have a scene that has hundreds of hours, none of which are the same. Like there's no two pieces of dialogue that are ever the same. And so just the editing kind of to turn all of that information into a cohesive and compelling scene, um, you kind of get the sense of why, you know, the editing took a long time, you know. Now, have you guys had the opportunity before the After Dark Film Fest, you know, have you screened it anywhere? Have you shown it to friends and family? What's response been? Well, we did some test screenings uh, as part of the post-production process um, where we screened various cuts in front of different audiences as we were refining mm-hmm. it and asking asking some, um, you know, focus group questions to make sure that our characters were really standing out to people. They like, I mean, there are a lot of characters. Uh, and initially, it whittles its way down as the movie goes on. But it, just so that they, uh, you know, that we could sort of refine, make sure we understood how the audience felt about each character and what we were doing. So, um, various cuts got got um, screened in front of uh, various volunteer audiences. We did do a casting crew screening for everybody. Um, uh, you know, but it was not actually the finished cut, and the sound wasn't done. So, it, it really, the first time anyone's gonna really see it is on October 16th when it's in the theaters, and um, it'll be a new movie to the ones that the, the cast group have seen before. Now, Mary Kate, you know the version that you saw. You know, what what are your overall impressions of the film, and what do you hope that fans take away from it? I actually was not able to attend that uh, cast and crew screening. I can't remember why now. I was out of town or something. So it will all be new to me. Now, with it being picked up by the After Dark 8 films to die for, you know, a lot of the films in that series, you know, they get a lot of run. They get a lot of attention. It's, it's very prestigious to be a part of this series. You know, when you guys found out that it was being picked up by After Dark, what were your thoughts, and and how excited are you guys for the October 16th release? Oh, we're over the moon. Uh, The After Dark people have been so supportive. They are, I mean, they love, they they sort of hand curate these movies, and they sort of are very loving about them, and they're very, I mean, they're from top to bottom, from the... um, the people working with marketing to the people who are dealing with deliverables for the theatrical run. Like we've just had nothing but white glove service. Like they love filmmakers. They love films and, and they really uh, treat us well. We've been very happy that we signed with them. Now, what was, uh, how were they, how did they first approach you guys? Um, I don't remember. I don't know how our film got on their radar. I think it was it through a Mosakai, uh, Dagan. It may have been. I mean, we've had. Yeah, it may have been through through a Mosakai at Echo Lake. Uh-huh. Yeah, we think it, we think it was. Uh, we got a referral, an industry referral, which is how I think the film reached them initially. And then they just contacted us by uh, by email and had us in for a meeting, and then the rest was done by phone. Well, now, of course, the film comes out October 16th, um, assorted cities around the United States, video on demand, DVDs and Blu-rays to follow. You know, what it, ultimately, for each one of you, what is it that you hope that people take away from this film? Oh, man. You guys go first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I mean, I, I have to say from... 
I mean, this was an experiment. Like, it was an experiment, and as all experiments go, it could have easily failed. Like, when we started this process, we had a lot of trust in the filmmakers and the actors, but we didn't know exactly if it would turn out to be anything interesting and certainly whether it would turn out to be a movie. And so the, the fact that they have been so supportive that they're releasing it in such a fantastic way, for me, it's just an absolute perfect scenario. Like, I couldn't imagine a better place, a better home for this film, for the process that we went through, and for it to find it. And so I, I'm, I'm just absolutely thrilled by it and just uh, overly excited. And I can't wait to see how people react. Like, it's a very different film. It's because we shot it in such a strange way, and especially when people find out how it was shot, it's just a very different film, and I, I, I can't wait to see how people react. I hope people come away with a sense of mystery. We were really going for that. Um, you know, we wanted to be very contemporary. We wanted to be very now. But we also wanted to be like those ruins that we feature, like pointing backward to, um, you know, to Agatha Christie and to old boardroom mysteries. And I, I hope the audience walks away with a sense of, of real mystery. Mary Kate? Um, that's so nice. I'm just I'm just really excited that it's finally, you know, getting out there and, and getting seen and finding a home because we all it was just a really special experience for us. Like I have said, like that's not something that I think any of us will probably do again and so it's it's really nice and fulfilling to finally be able to share it with audiences. Now before I let you guys go I definitely, you know, I want to say congratulations. I think the movie looks fantastic. I personally cannot wait to see it and do a review for it for Horror Society. Um, Dagan, starting with you, you know, if if fans want to follow your work, uh, you know, where can they go to follow you and what do you have coming up on the horizon? Um, you know, I stay pretty active. I, I, I'm a, I love making independent film. I have uh, two other films that are in post-production right now. The one that uh, is closest to completion is a film called Deep Burial, starring Dominic Monaghan. And, uh, and, and speaking of, like, my penchant for, for, I guess, foreign places, we shot this film. It takes place in the future, but we shot the entire film uh, in the underground abandoned nuclear missile silo. And, and uh, mm. so, I, 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 so it has the same sense. It, it was not an experimental film. We had a script by some very talented screenplay screenwriters, but it's uh, I'm, I'm, it's another film I'm very excited about. So, uh, Doc, for me, how about you? The next, uh, my uh, my writing and producing partner Kevin Burke and I are supervising producers and head writers for Ultimate Spider-Man Season 4, which will start airing on Disney XD in January. Very nice. Mary-Kate? Oh, man. Um, uh, you can find me on the Internet. <laughs> uh, Twitter is my, my main hub at MK Wild. I have done quite a few web series, and I have another one coming out soon called Muzzle the Musical, which is kind of a fantastical musical thing. And I have a couple other feature films that will be out in the near future. One is called The Sound in the Shadow, and one is called Hello, My Name is Frank. And um, I also am on the cover of a book that came out today all across the country, so you might see me in a bookstore. <laughs> I, I did see that on Facebook today. <laughs> now it has to be yeah. asked. It's been asked of everyone so far on the Eight Films to Die For panel. Is there the potential for a sequel? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't. Seems like a one-time thing. What do you think, guys? Yeah, uh, this is it. Enjoy it while you got it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, guys, I want to thank you so much for being on. Again, as I said, I'm really looking forward to seeing the film. I wish you guys all the success in the world on October 16th with the with the movie release, VOD, DVD sales. If you guys ever have any other uh, genre projects going on, you're always welcome on this podcast. Um, if you have any news, let me know, and I'll get it up on Horror Society. Thank you so awesome. much. Thank sure you. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, guys. I appreciate it, yeah. 
Thank you for being on. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, this evening we have had writer-director Dagan Merrill, writer-producer Doc Wyatt, and actress Mary Kate Wiles on all from Murder in the Dark, part of After Dark's Horror Fest, Eight Films to Die For. October 16th is the release date at certain cities around the United States. If it's around you theatrically, make sure to take your ass out there and see it. Support these films. This is the heart of what our genre is. If you can't find it in a city playing near you, make sure to check it out on video on demand. Pick up the Blu-rays and DVDs when they are released. In fact, when I get that information, I will post that on Horse Society. Coming up in a few minutes, we're going to go into our second digital dismemberment spotlight for the evening. We will be covering Scream Factory's Blu-ray Collector's Edition release of Tales from the Crypt, Demon Knight. But before that, we're going to go into our final Metal Massacre spotlight for the evening. Once again, the name of the band is Battle Cross. The CD is Rise to Power. The song is Shackles.
welcome back. That was Battle Cross from their most recent CD, Rise to Power. The name of the song was Shackles. Make sure to head on over to Metal Blade Records. Pick up this brand new album from Battle Cross. Check out the band merchandise where they'll be touring and all of the other great things that Metal Blade Records brings to us. But now, ladies and gentlemen, once t- once again, it is time for some digital dismemberment. <laughs> Digital Dismemberment Spotlight for the evening. We are covering Scream Factory's Blu-ray release of the collector's edition of Tales from the Crypt, Demon Knight. Just in time for Halloween festivities, fans of the wildly popular Tales from the Crypt rejoice as the collector's edition of Tales from the Crypt presents Demon Knight and Tales from the Crypt presents Bordello of Blood hits home entertainment shelves everywhere on October 20th of this year from Scream Factory. Now, we are not covering Bordello of Blood tonight. We will be covering that on Friday's show. And just so you know, these are two separate discs. This is not a two-disc special feature or anything like that. Infested with a talented cast, thrilling special effects, and the Crypt Keeper's deadpan delights, Demon Knight is directed by genre vet Ernest Dickerson, who's also done The Walking Dead, Dexter, and Master of Horror, and features a strong cast, including Billy Zane of Titanic, William Sadler from Iron Man 3, Jada Pinkett from Gotham, Brenda Bakke from L.A. Confidential, CCH Pounder of Orphan and Avatar, Thomas Hayden Church from Spider-Man 3 and Sideways, Dick Miller from Gremlins, and Charles Fleischer from Zodiac. Both of these Blu-rays are highly sought after cult by horror cult classic. Both highly sought after cult horror classics debut for the first time on Blu-ray. Each collector's edition Blu-ray features exciting bonus content, newly rendered retro-style artwork, a reversible wrap with theatrical key art, and more. Avid fans and collectors, please take note. Those who, who order Tales from the Crypt Presents, Demon Knight, and Bordello of Blood directly from ShoutFactory.com and get the order shipped two weeks early also receive exclusive 18x24 posters featuring the newly commissioned artwork. Available while supplies last. I absolutely love this movie. I remember going to theaters and watching this. Tales from the Crypt was one of my favorite all-time cable TV shows, and I wish it's something that they would bring back, especially nowadays. There's just so much more that could be mined from that series. I wish it was something that would be given uh, serious thought. A little bit of more background info. A mysterious drifter known as Breaker, played by William Sadler, possesses the last of seven ancient keys that hold the power to stop the forces of darkness and protect all humanity from ultimate evil. But the human race is safe only so long as Breaker can evade the demonic collector, played by Billy Zane, who has gathered the other six keys. In his obsessive quest for the key, the Collector rallies an army of ghastly cadavers against Breaker and the inhabitants of a run-down hotel. Armed with automatic weapons, sacred blood, and sadistic humor, Breaker and the strong-willed Geraldine, played by Jada Pinkett Smith, must lead the other guests in a gruesome battle against the Collector and his evil horde of ghouls. There is just so much to like about this film. Uh, It opens up on an old New Mexico desert road. Uh, The collector, Billy Zane, is pursuing Breaker in another vehicle. Uh, Breaker's vehicle runs out of gas, and he attempts to shoot out the collector's car, which crashes into his and explodes. Breaker makes off on his own and eventually tries to steal uh, another car but is caught and uh, runs off. 
he runs into uh, Uncle Willie, who's played by Dick Miller, and he winds up taking him back to this boarding house where he lives. Who, uh, it's owned by Irene, CCH Pounder. Um, there he meets prostitute Cordelia, uh, a postal clerk named Wally, and uh, Geraldine, who's working there as part of a work release program. Later on, uh, Cordelia's boyfriend Roach arrives and is telling everyone about the theft, uh, the attempted theft of the car. Um, Irene gets suspicious and calls the sheriff, uh, Sheriff Tupper and Deputy Bob. Well, they've run into the collector, and he convinces them that Breaker is a thief. Well, after examining the car that was almost stolen and going to the hotel, uh, the sheriff and his deputy place Breaker under arrest. And the collector is about to collect the key, but as it turns out, they did background checks on him and found out that his car was stolen. So the sheriff attempts to take him in, but when he does... The collector shows him true self and winds up killing the sheriff. All hell begins to break loose. Breaker uses the blood from the uh, the artifact that he's carrying to seal the buildings and the windows and tells everyone that they need just to wait till the end of the night and they'll live through it. Well, infighting begins and the collector starts using mind control and psychic powers to possess different people in the house, all with gruesome endings and and things along the way. When he's finally pressed, Breaker tells everyone the history of the key and everything that's going on. Once God created the key, demons use the seven keys to focus the power of the cosmos into their hands. When discovered, God created light, which scattered the demons and the keys across the universe. Breaker has the last key they need to reclaim power, and to protect it, God gave it to a thief and filled it with the blood of Jesus Christ. The guardian of the key is immortal while holding it, but once once they die it need, or are dying, it needs to be passed on, refilling it with their own blood when that time comes. Breaker had gotten the key from his superior officer during World War I. Well, as the movie progresses and more and more of the members of the house are possessed and and killed by the demons and the collector, uh, as a last-ditch effort, Irene and Bob discover that Wally, the postal clerk worker who had been fired from his job, had a trunk full of weapons in the attic. Unfortunately, he didn't have any ammo, but he did have a vest made with grenades. At a pivotal moment in the film, they use the vest to help the last surviving members try to escape from the collector. Uh, I don't want to give away any more of that. There's, you know, the ending of this, the film, and everything that goes on in between is just absolutely stunning. I will say I really enjoyed the look and feel of the demons. It definitely has a Tales from the Crypt flavor to it. It's funny when you watch some of the behind the scenes, they talk about how initially they didn't want to do them as actual demons, but more of like men in business suits and sunglasses. But thankfully, they were convinced to um, go with a little bit more of a demonic approach. I think what really sets this film in overdrive is the just incredible acting performance of Billy Zane. Um, It's stated in behind the scenes that a lot of his uh, later movie roles – came on the strength of his performance in Demon Knight. It's, it, you know, it's just very powerful. It, it's comedic and at the same time very chilling how charismatic his demonic character is and the lengths that he will go to to get that key. I really love the locations. I thought that uh, the directing was great. I think the ensemble of the cast is absolutely amazing when you look back on it. Uh, originally, this was supposed to uh, – this film was actually conceived before the HBO series started and went through several rewrites before it eventually became the film. Uh, initially, there had been talks of From Dusk Till Dawn being the first Tales from the Crypt film, and there was also talk of The Frighteners, Peter Jackson's The Frighteners being the first 
uh, Tales from the Crypt film, but eventually it became uh, Tales from the Crypt Demon Knight. As, you know, as as far as an entertaining film, I give this movie uh, a three and a half, so close to four stars. Again, uh, everyone's everyone's performance in this film is amazing. You know, it's always nice to see Dick Miller in something, but again, I really feel like Billy Zane steals the show more so than Jada Pickett Smith or anyone else that's in the movie. As far as special features go, there's a new audio commentary with director Ernest Dickerson. There's a new audio commentary with special makeup effects creator Todd Masters, visual effects supervisor John Van Villette, special effects coordinator Thomas Bellissimo, and demon performer Walter uh, Fallon. There's a new Under Siege, The Making of Tales from the Crypt Presents Demon Knight, featuring interviews with director Ernest Dickerson, co-producer A.L. Katz, screenwriters Ethan uh, Reif, Sirius Voris, and Mark Bishop, Stars Billy Zane, William Stadler, uh, Brenda Bakke, uh, Charles Fleischer, John Shuck, and Dick Miller. Editor Stephen Lovejoy, special makeup effects creator Todd Masters, special makeup, makeup effects artist Scott Coulter and Scott Wheeler, and Demon uh, performer Walt Phelan. Everything that you pretty much want to know about this film is covered in that. Um, you get a lot of interesting backstory, especially to talk about the different looks for the demons and ideas that they had for the characters. There's also a panel discussion from the American Cin uh, Cinematique featuring director Ernest Dickerson, actor Dick Miller, and special effects maestro Rick Baker. It's kind of nice to hear them reminisce a little bit about the film. They cover uh, cover a little bit of ground in that. Much more is covered in in the uh, Under Siege, The Making of Tales from the Crypt Presents Demon Knight featurette. There's also uh, a still gallery and the theatrical trailer. Um, I think they did a fantastic job with this. As uh, one of my fellow co-podcasters talks about, Chris McGibbon, who does Creepshow Radio, um, the transfers for this are the same from the original release. So there's uh, it, it, it looks sharp, but it's not a completely new transfer from the film. So that could possibly be the only thing that some people might complain about with this particular release. Other than that, uh, the amazing wealth of information and everything on here, um, I give this disc uh, an 8 out of 10. The only thing that would have been cooler is if they had included the soundtrack because the soundtrack had a lot of great musicians and a lot of, gr you know, a lot of great music on it. I would highly recommend you head on over to shoutfactory.com and pick up your copy of Tales from the Crypts Presents. Demon Knight. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think we had another fantastic show this evening. I want to say thank you to Tatiana and everyone over at the After Dark Horror Fest, Eight Films to Die For. They got us our interview this evening with writer-director Dagan Merrill, writer and producer Doc Wyatt, and actress Mary Kate Wiles of the upcoming film Murder in the Dark, which you can see on October 16th, both in theaters around the country and on video on demand. I want to say thank you to Renny Young, Miss Misery, for sending me um, the video link copy of Forgotten Tales. SGL Entertainment's releasing that sometime in 2016. When I get a hard target date for that, I will let all of you know so that you can check that out. I want to say thank you to our friends at Metal Blade Records for sending us along Battle Cross's Rise to Power. Make sure to head on over to MetalBladeRecords.com and find out everything that's going on with them and all of the other bands on that fantastic label. The brand new edition of Living Dead Magazine should be hitting the newsstand soon. And don't forget, in November, the Living Dead convention going on in Portland, Oregon. Be there or be dead. We'll be back this Friday with the next film in the eight films to die for series keep an eye out on horrorsociety.com for details on that show and until next week ladies and gentlemen this is your head undertaker the dead mad michael jones of horrorsociety.com and living dead magazine telling you all good evening and rest in peace